G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey, and today we are continuing the Must Draft Player Series. We are looking at the mid rounds from rounds or from pick one, uh, 51 to 120. Who are the players that we like the most and who do we have to get in our team? Let's go! Six. Jordan, open! Chicago with the lead! Not a game, we talking about practice. LeBron James with no regard for human life. Andy Bogdanovich! Back out to Allen, his three-pointer, bang! Curry for three, wow! Unbelievable, making it rain in New York. We the North, or now we the champions. Not the destination. G'day and welcome again to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey, and you can find me on Twitter, uh, on X, whatever it is, uh, at, at Ball Boys Fantasy. Please do go and make sure you follow me over there, especially as the season is under one week away. I will be putting most of my thoughts up there. Um, if you want quick reactions to any news that drops between podcasts, which we'll be going to once a week once the season begins. Um, but we are continuing a video series, uh, podcast series that began yesterday, um, where we're doing the must draft player series. Okay. Now there is no such thing as a literal must draft player. There are many ways to win fantasy basketball, but essentially this is the list of players. Um, I've got 10 in each zone. A list of 10 players that I like to target within each different rounds of the draft. So yesterday's podcast, we did the early rounds, which uh, basically I consider, basically pick 1 to 50, the first four or so rounds of the draft. That is the nucleus of your team, the beginnings of your team structure and build. Um, we talked about those players. Today, we're going from picks 51 to 120. So a little bigger range, 70 players instead of 50 yesterday. Uh, number one, because I don't love a lot of players in this range. And number two, because after pick 120, then you're getting into your bench players. So the first um, 10 rounds, these are your starters still. So when we get further on, we're going to talk about some players that you can take some more flyers, some later round guys. Um, so... That's why I've gone to 120 here. And also, like I said, guys, I don't love this range of the draft. There's a lot of players that I will have on this list, which I like. I don't necessarily love them, and I don't think they're going to present huge value. I think this part of the draft is also kind of about avoiding the landmines, avoiding the players that are going to ruin your team, avoiding the players that are going to bust and, and be unusable. Um, so... Whilst some of these guys, I don't know if you're going to get massive, massive steals. I also think there's some of these guys that can be very useful and very low risk of completely flopping, um, which which is what we're going to talk about with some of these guys as well. So um, let's get into it. I am going based on Yahoo's rank. There are a few players on here that the Yahoo rank, I think, is a little bit misleading, especially in more competitive drafts, the drafts that I have done. Some of these players are going either much later or much earlier than what their rank is suggesting. I am doing this list based on the Yahoo draft, but we'll talk about the players individually if their rank is maybe um, a bit lower or a bit higher than where I'm seeing these players actually go. So, Trying to thread the needle, it's not going to be 100% all the time. I hope you guys realize that, and let's get stuck into it. The first player is Jarrett Allen, which I believe might have been on my bust show last year, and he wasn't He wasn't a bust. He was fine. Um, actually signed a contract extension in the offseason, and I'm putting him here, his Yahoo rank of 56. This is one of those players where I don't think he really smashes this out of the park, but... He is a very useful player in certain builds where you're trying to still look after your rebounding. His scoring is not terrible, and his free throw percentage specifically is why he makes this list because he he's not going to hurt you from the free throw line. His scoring improved a bit last year. Um, he's not a high minutes player, so I'm not worried too much about the drop in minutes. Um, and just the the risk of him being traded or, or um, reduced his role, which I had a little bit of concerns the year before. Um, when I thought they were going to be, you know, elevating Mobley into more at centre. Um, I think it's a little bit less this time around because of that extension that they gave him. Um, and he is simply just someone when you kind of get to this spot of the draft, we've seen it in a lot of mocks, 
the center run is crazy. Um, and a lot of the centers that you're drafting in certain situations have pretty significant uh, limitations. Now, Jared Allen still won't hit you any threes. Um, he's not a big assist or steals guy, but he's, he's not bad at sort of the other things when it comes to his free throw percentage. He's going to block a few shots. He's going to get you the really good rebounds, and he feels really, really safe, whereas a lot of those other guys, I think, have a bit more risks associated to them, um, or they're going to have to be certain type of build type players where you might need to be punting free throws to, to really handle the, the negative that they bring to that category, whereas Allen fits a lot of different sort of um, types of builds. So he's a pretty safe guy to recommend. But like I said, I don't think he's necessarily going to smash this ranking out of the park, but I also don't think he's going to fall very far away from it. So it's a very safe pick. Maybe you've gone a bit upside um, either earlier or you, you've got some other guys you want to really target later that are a little bit riskier. I think he's a nice player to go for and a player that I've drafted in one of my three leagues so far. Um uh, I've got a couple of auction drafts coming up soon, so uh, we'll see what he goes for in those ones. But he is someone that, yeah, if you're looking for rebounds, especially those punt blocks or punt threes teams and you're trying to look after your free throw percentage still a little bit, he's a good guy to target. We're going to go straight to his teammate, um, which is Darius Garland at rank 61. I do see him starting to creep up into the 50s a little bit now in some of the drafts. I've taken him, I think, at 52 or 3 in a couple of different drafts. I think I've got him in two drafts so far. Um, he is a guy that's been top 50 before. Uh, multiple times, he's been top 40 before. He, a couple of years ago, I think we were drafting him in the second or third rounds uh, because we wanted to get that next elevation. It didn't come. Um, and it's not because Donovan Mitchell is there because he's had top 40 seasons with Donovan Mitchell there. Last year, he had a few injuries that really set him back and he had a really down year because of that. Um, and some people will link the two together, but he is capable of much, much better even with Donovan Mitchell on this side. Um, Again, I think that the biggest um, risk for him, if, if you are absolutely way against turnovers, then he's not going to necessarily rank very well. He turns the ball over a decent amount, but I think he can improve there still this year. But the elite assist that he's going to give you is very, very difficult to find later in the drafts. I think his scoring can bounce back up. I think his threes can bounce back up. His field goal percentage can bounce back up. Um, and to get you a guy that's going to score you 18, 19 points with eight assists per game, two to two and a half threes per game, a steal... It's very, very useful, very, very valuable. His free throw percentage is really nice. Um, I just think that he is one of the better mid-round options to really make a difference in your assists if you didn't get a really big head start to them early on in your draft because those guys that give you eight plus assists and give you good scoring, give you threes and give you good free throw percentage are really, really helpful for those type of builds. So if you're punting any of the big man stats, blocks, rebounds, um, combining them with turnovers. like He's going to be super, super valuable for those types of builds. So I really do like Darius Garland, and I've got him already on a couple of teams as someone who I think can be very, very useful for your teams. The next guy, he's a little bit behind, so I did this a little bit out of order, but Zach Levine is someone, like I said before, I don't think the Yahoo rank represents where these guys are going in a lot of cases because his Yahoo rank of 58, I don't love as much, but often... I'm finding Zach Levine falling into the mid to late 60s in draft. I've got him, I think, in at least two drafts so far at that point because people are worried about his injury history from last year. Obviously, he didn't play very many games. But the subsequent, the previous years before that, he was relatively healthy. He's looked pretty good in the preseason. I think his first game, he was a little rusty. But since then, he's been putting up some decent stat lines. He's not coming into the season with any injury concerns, which he was, I believe, last year. It was either last year or the year before that he was coming in with a lot of question marks. Um, but this year, he looks like he's he's fresh and ready to go. There's a few trade concerns and rumors. But the way I see it at this point, I, I think if you're trading for Zach Levine, you, you're knowing what you're going to get. So you're not investing a top 30 or 40 pick in this player. At, at, you know, at most, he's sort of like 60-ish, which I think is okay. But if he's going closer to 70, I think it's a pretty good steal and could see him returning back to top 50 value. Think about the fact that DeMar DeRozan is no longer there. Vucevic is another year older. Um, I think that while he's in Chicago, he comfortably clears this spot fairly easily. Um, and if he's traded, I think he basically maybe ends up around this spot anyway. And that's only if he gets traded. So 
The real only risk that it goes wrong for you is if he goes down and the injuries really um, hamper him a, a lot. But there are a lot of guys around this sign-up zone where you could say the very similar kind of things. He's not 30 years old yet. He kind of feels like a bit of an older player, but he's he's not 30 years old yet. Um, so I'm not as concerned with him as I am with some of the others in, in and around this spot that maybe have a similar kind of injury um, taint to them. So I'm quite happy to get him. Say, for example, a lot of players will, a lot of people go for your, your Jordan Pools or your Cam Thomas or your Bradley Beals as those scoring players, the players that can give you 25 points per game potentially. Um, I think I would take Zach Levine in most cases ahead of all of them because he can do them do it efficiently. We've seen him do it multiple times. Um, he is someone who on. He can give you a little bit more than the other guys do. Maybe I started Jordan Poole with his assists, um, but I think he can give you sort of four to five rebounds per game, four to five assists per game. He can give you more than a steal per game. He does it with better field goal percentage than all of those guys, say for maybe Bradley Beal. Um, really good uh, efficiency from the free throw line. He gives you good volume in threes. So he's just a bit more of a complete rounder than, say, like a Cam Thomas. He's also more proven than a Cam Thomas as well. Uh, the fact that he's not yet 30 years old makes me feel a little bit more comfortable with his injury history. Um, and there's there's a bit more usage to go around with, with DeMar DeRozan uh, than there has been the last previous few years. So I still think that Levine is someone that we shouldn't be discounting too much. And I think in a lot of situations, you can get him in the 60s, closer to pick 70. And I think that's a bit of a steal. So um, Yahoo rank 58. I think there's a little bit of wiggle room for value, um, but it's more, I, I guess, anecdotally, I, I think he is going a little bit later than that. And, and I think he's a, a good value player. So he makes this list. Bit of a shock one here. And long-time um, viewers, listeners will be a little bit surprised to hear me say, but Tobias Harris makes my list. Uh, he has been a bus candidate for the last several years, but he is in a different situation this year. And I'm back in on Tobias Harris. He is going from a situation where he was previously behind Joel Embiid. And last year, he actually wasn't too bad either. And I was a bit indifferent about the Tobias Harris last year. It was really when James Harden was there that I hated I hated selecting him because when Harden was, you know, panning the, the ball, the air out of the ball, um, Tobias wasn't left to do too much. And he's just a guy that probably doesn't do as well in head-to-head leagues in minus one rankings. Definitely more of an across-the-board uh, accumulator. But I think he is a really solid punt threes. Uh, player. He is someone who I think on the Detroit Pistons is going to get an elevated role, elevated usage, further increasing his free throw percentage impact, which is actually quite strong. Um, he's going to give you solid rebounds, points. The assists will be decent from a power forward. The defensive stats are, are fairly average, and he's very efficient in terms of not turning the ball over. So in certain builds, I do think he is a positive. At 63, he feels really safe, and I just don't think the floor is anywhere near as low as it was when he was with those ball-dominant guards like um, uh, Harden as well as a Joel Embiid or a J- Embiid and a Tyrese Maxey. It's him and Cade, and I think it's going to be that way for a while. Um, there's no one really coming to supplant him from a, a second uh, fiddle point of view. So, again, it's probably one of the ones like Jared Allen where I don't think you're going to get a massive, massive steal, but I don't think there's much room to fall down either. So if, you, if you're if you just in the business of avoiding the bad picks at this point and, and getting someone really solid, I think Tobias fits the bill. And I'm in on Tobias Harris here. I guess he's he's kind of in this spot just to, for me to prove a point that I don't always have the same kind of guys that I like or dislike year to year. And also, like I said, there's not many guys in this kind of range that I actually love. Um, Tobias Harris, I, I've had myself sort of gravitating towards him a few times. The next guy here is another one of those ones where the rankings... I think doesn't tell the full story, but I put him in the list anyway. Isaiah Hartenstein. His Yahoo rank is 71. And I think he's starting to go a lot earlier than this. He was a guy that myself and a lot of other analysts, and it's all right, guys, we can all have similar opinions. It doesn't mean we're copying off each other. Like sometimes people just know this shit. Um, and we may all, may all be wrong. Um, Isaiah Hartenstein is ranked 71, but I've seen him going and creeping up into the 50s even. And when we're starting to get to the 50s, I'm starting to go, okay, that's a bit too far for me now. If I can get him in the the late 60s, early 70s, I love it. I love the pick. But 
going early than that, I think we're starting to take on too much risk and we're cutting into his upside. He is not going to be a scorer. Um, I think he could score more than he would than he did in, in New York, but I still don't think it's going to be a very high positive for him. There's still also a little bit of uncertainty around his role. Is he starting? Is he coming off the bench? Is he a 25-minute-a-night guy or is he a 29-minute-a-night player? Um, that kind of changes his range. So he's not without risk. Um, there's definitely a potential that this does go bad, but he has an outstanding fantasy profile. He rebounds. He's actually a really good passer for a big man. Great assists, um, I think, and it looks like they're going to use him a little bit more in that capacity. Um, he steals the ball pretty solidly for a big man as well. The blocks are good. The field goal percentage is elite, um, and he's good for in the free throw line as well. The only thing he doesn't really do is hit threes, and he doesn't score very much. Um, so he's a really, really good, well-rounded fantasy player. Um, doesn't hurt you in too many builds, um, at least more than most other big men. So he just is a really friendly fantasy player. Really, really suited to a punt points build, which um, if you know me, you know I, that's my favorite fantasy punting strategy uh, for this year and, and for the past couple of years. So he fits what I like to do, especially if I'm in that type of a build. Um, and that instance going in in the 50s, I think is okay. But other than that, if you're, if you're not punting the points, I think you probably would be better off waiting to the late 60s, 70s and just getting that last little bit of scoring before you, you before you take the plunge on Isaiah Hartenstein because he might not score 10 points per game, but he will do a lot else. Um, he is a bit of a, a fantasy analyst darling and I think the hype is pushing him up probably eventually to the point where I don't want to draft him. Um, but again, based on his Yahoo rank at 71, and if maybe your league is not as plugged into those kind of that hype, um, then and he is going around this spot, then I do want to. I did want to include him in this video um, for those that maybe um, are a little bit more shielded from all that hype. And and he he does fall down to this spot, and and they're going a bit more off the rankings. So Isaiah Hartenstein is someone I'd be happy to pounce on maybe um, six to twelve spots uh, earlier. Let's go to the next one. Similar kind of story with Jordan Poole. Now, he was a guy I was big on last year. I was wrong last year. I'm hesitant to go and throw my head, hat back in the ring, but you're not drafting him anywhere near where he was being drafted last year. They've confirmed that he's going to be the starting point guard. Malcolm Brogdon is out to start the season with an injury. So all things are kind of pointing Jordan Poole's way. Um, at 79, I think you, you are definitely shielding yourself from a lot of the downside. So I think he could come... He could beat this spot by about 30 positions, I believe, um, at 79. I am seeing him going more in the 60s, um, definitely. So he's going more in that Zach Levine territory in a lot of the mocks that I'm doing. Um, in most instances, I am still preferring Zach Levine unless... Um, Unless I really need a big boost in either my assists or free throw percentage, uh, I think those are the two categories that Poole would have over a Zach Levine. But I think Zach Levine basically clears him in all the other categories. So um, I, I think that he is someone that don't get too... There's still room for him to burn us. Like, he definitely was bad last year. Um, and he could be bad again this year. I think he will be better. I think playing point guard helps him. It helps his assists. The one thing that I still just can't wrap my head around is why his free throw uh, attempt rate just fell off a cliff last year um, compared to what he was in in Golden State in a lower usage, oh sorry, uh, a lower minute role. His usage basically stayed the same, or if not dropped a little bit, and his free throw rate fell a fair bit. And for a player like him who shoots high eighty percentage, if if he can bring that back up closer to five free throw attempts a game, that would be massively uh, important for his value. So. Um, Plenty of room to smash this, a little bit of room to maybe be a little bit of a disappointment, but I think the value favors getting some good, um, a good return from picking him. I'd be happy to go into sort of the, the mid to late 60s to get a Jordan Poole if he, if he provided what I was looking for. Um, where I think he is going to provide some decent value. So I'd probably go a round or a round and a half earlier on him if I needed to. But if I'm going to the 50s, I think it's too early. So um, definitely someone at, at his rank of 79, I think you're getting some good value there. Similar kind of story with this player. The Yahoo rankings for Ivica Zubats is 100. I can see him going much earlier than this, especially with the run on centers that seems to happen in that round, round seven. Um, which is sort of around the 
70s, 80s is where I see him going a lot of the time. Once you're getting the guys like Jarrett Allen, like DeAndre Ayton, um, a few of these other guys go off the board, um, potentially Mark Williams if people aren't too worried about his injury. Um, once those guys are going off the board, Zubach kind of goes next and, and he kind of can sometimes get pushed up into that group. And I like Zubats. Similar to some of these safer guys, I don't think he's got a huge upside. I think he's going to be better this year with, obviously, you no know, Paul George, but I don't know if it's going to be massively better. I think compared to some other analysts, I'm a little bit lower on him than others. So I wanted to include him on this list because at rank 100, I love it. I think it's great. And you're going to need those centers that don't destroy your free throws, give you the rebounds, solid blocks, um, really good field goal percentage. He's definitely going to be good. I don't think I'd be reaching into... The 70s, I wouldn't be going that far. I think if you got him in the late 80s, that's a nice sweet spot. 90s, definitely, um, depending on what other big men are around. But I don't think I'd be reaching into the 70s, which I have seen him go in. Sometimes I've even seen him go in the 60s because that center run is so um, clumped together. People have that sort of FOMO. And um, at that point, instead of me reaching for a player, I might pivot to do something else, look look elsewhere. Um because I think you're just cutting off all the value when you do that. I don't think he's a super high upside player, but he should comfortably beat 100, in my opinion. Um, so if you're drafting him at 100, I think you're getting maybe 20 spots of value. If you're drafting him at 80, I think you're kind of cutting off a little bit. Um, maybe not too much if, you, if you're going like mid-80s. I think maybe still got maybe a round's worth of value there, potentially baked in. Um, but he is, again, someone I think he's... Weirdly, Zubac, not being the most exciting player, getting a little bit hyped, but he still makes this list based on the rankings. Um, all right, the next guy. The next guy, I am going to claim that this is this is my guy. The first mock draft I did, I got a lot of feedback saying that what the hell was I doing drafting uh, Walker Kessler in the 70s? But that seems to be more normal these days uh, now that we get close to the season. He is ranked 107th, and I think it is because it's looking more and more likely that he's going to start and play 26-plus minutes a night, which is what I expected, with John Collins likely coming off the bench. So again, ranked at 107. Um, he disappointed a lot of people last year. But on his nine-cat ranking, I think he was in the 80s. Now, that involves him not turning the ball over and his huge amount of blocks. So I don't quite rate... Uh, rate him at that spot, but he did that in 22 minutes. Um, he was the big hype guy last year, and I was the guy saying, no, no, do not draft him into the top 50. Don't probably draft him in the top 60, and I think I was proven right last year, but this year, I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to say that I think this guy's really good value. Um, I, I love getting his blocks late. Again, he's not going to score much, but at this point, you, you don't worry too much about that. You can deal with that. You should have already dealt with that, um, but the the ability to get the, the the big rebounds, the huge blocks, the awesome field goal percentage. You're not going to get anything else. You're not going to get assists. You're not going to get steals. You're not going to get any scoring or threes. Keep that in mind. You're getting what he is, but he is one of the best at what he does. Um, and I think that the minutes are going to increase this year. 107, I think there's 30 to 40 spots of value. I wouldn't be drafting him in the 60s or anything like that. There's a definite argument to make about going him over a Zubats, and I think I might actually make it. I just think his blocks are more valuable. So I'd probably, if I was desperate for a big man, I'd go him ahead of a Zubats, knowing that I've got to sort of account for his free throw shooting a little bit more. Um, but I just think that his blocks are going to be way more reliable and in higher volume. So I think I'd be happy to go if I'm really looking for a big man into the late 70s, if that big man run is really spooking me. Um, but probably no, no higher than that. Um, 107, it's easy money, I think. But a lot of times he is getting pushed up a little bit more now. Probably not as much as Zubac because people still have a little bit of concerns about his role in playing time or have been burnt by him last year. Um, but I, I do like him at 107. I think it's it's great. The next guy here is probably one of my biggest um, guys that I'm championing this year. It's Amen Thompson. I think Amen Thompson is likely the most likely candidate to be the Jalen Johnson this season. Um, being the guy who hasn't started much before, the guy who we're not 100% sure if he is going to start, but when he does, and I say when, when he does, I don't think he's going to give it back up. Um, he's ranked at 112. 
Um, he was going out to the top 120. I think those days are over. I think he's the kind of guy... I mean, it's funny. His brother was kind of this type of guy last year, Asar Thompson. And it worked out great for the first month and a half. And then he fell off a cliff. I don't have the same concerns about a, a man that I did with Asar in terms of that value dropping away. I think a man is one of the best prospects on this Houston Rockets team. Him and Shangun, I think, are the guys they should build around. And I said this before on Dan Bespris's show, any injury, even if he's not starting, any injury to from point guard to center, he gets the benefit. He gets the primary boost. Last year, Shangun was out for a period. He got injected into the starting lineup, and he was great. He is a really, really strong fantasy player. The steals are elite. The rebounds are excellent for a guard. Um, the field goal percentage is awesome for a guard. He can block shots. He's good assists. What he won't do is he won't shoot threes. His free throw percentage is poor, but he's kind of like a Lonzo Ball in the way that he doesn't get there very often, so it's not a huge negative. And he doesn't shoot threes. Did I say that already? He doesn't shoot threes. He doesn't score. I can't remember which one I said. Um, but So again, kind of my... Um, preference in terms of punting for punting points fits like a glove. Um, so I've drafted him in a couple of leagues. Um, I snagged him sometimes in the turn at about pick 90, 92, I think was the earliest I drafted him. So about, what's that, 20 spots higher than his Yahoo rank. Any earlier, I think you're starting to cut off a little bit of upside. But if he fits, like if you're punting points and you need that steals guy, that rebounds guy, like... Could he be better than a Jalen Suggs this year? Absolutely, he could. Um, would you bank on it? There's definitely more risk, I, I think. He doesn't have a, as clear of a role, but I think his fantasy profile is better. Um, if they both play the same amount of games, I'd rather amend. Um, especially if you need that bit of field goal percentage, a little bit more rebounding. Um, he's going to do that, and I just think there's a lot of untapped potential with Amen Thompson. So... I don't want to hype him too much up and, and you start reaching into the 80s and, and things like that. I think that's, again, cutting into the upside. But if you have to reach, if you're on the turn like I was and you get him in the 90s just to make sure he's on your team, I, I would be okay doing that. And my philosophy for late rounds, and we'll talk about this a bit more on the, the last show, is if there's a guy that you really like, don't be afraid to go before your finishing team is. I've heard some people talk about, and I think Josh says this on his show, that he likes to go get the starting 10 sorted, and then the last three or four rounds go with the upside guys. I, If there's a guy, and last year it was Jalen Johnson, if there's a guy this year, it's, it's a man for me. If there's a guy I really like, and he fits what I'm looking for, he fits my build, the upside is, is really there, I'm okay going around early in round 9, 10, before I finish my starting 10 teams, and then maybe doing some more boring picks in the later rounds because... I just want to make sure I get the guy that I'm most confident in having that upside, having that and realizing that potential because there's no point waiting to the last few picks to do my flyers if someone takes the guy that I actually wanted and I'm forced to take a guy that is a quote-unquote flyer, but really his chance of success is like 15% versus someone like an Amen Thompson where I think his chance of being that guy is about 60%. I think it's a much higher um, potential to happen and I think the... The, the chance and when it does hit I think it's going to be a big uh, big um, improvement to your fantasy side so I'm willing to risk that a little bit earlier knowing that maybe I'm not going to go as many volume high flyers in the later round so he's kind of a flyer but he's a flyer that I'm willing to take before the quote-unquote actual flyers start to go in round nine or ten so all that said I'm happy to go in the 90s to get an Amen Thompson I think he still has potentially 40 spots of value of upside. He's got a very wide range of outcomes, but he just has such a nice fantasy game as long as you're willing to live with the lack of threes scoring and this slightly poor effect to your free throw percentage. The last guy here to just sneak into the cutoff here is Keontae George, ranking at 120 on Yahoo's ranks there. Um... I think, and he's, he's currently injured, I think, at the moment. I'm not super concerned, but it is something just to monitor um, the news with, with him. But I, I'm pretty happy to get him at 120. I'd probably go as high as pick 100, I, I would say, assuming that the, the injury news is not something to be super alarmed at. Um, what was his injury? Let me quickly look it up. I think it was a, a knee. He had a little bit of a knee thing. Um Okay, no, so he's been 
Du, 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 du. Oh, Yahoo doesn't even have anything on, on there. But basically, yeah, I, th- I think it's it's nothing to be too concerned about. I, I'm pretty sure he's going to be there to start the season. So um, I'm, I'm happy to take a flyer at Keontae George. He did play substantial minutes last year. Um, didn't really fully take off, but there were definitely the signs there. The assists, the threes, which is really, really nice. Um, the good free throw percentage, the solid scoring. Um, rookies... The, the easiest and most predictable improvement that they're going to make is to their field goal percentage, which was his huge drain last year. Um, 39% from the field of, of the season. I think he has a chance to push that closer to 43 44%, which is still a negative, but by no means as big of a negative as it was. The defensive stats is probably where it's going to cap his upside. I don't think he's going to be a guy that gives you 1.3 steals per game. If he gets to one steal per game, that's a win. You, you take that. Uh, I think that'd be a good outcome. Um, and he's not going to block any shots. So keep that in mind. If you're looking for that, maybe go for someone with a bit more of um, a steals upside, like an Amen Thompson, like a Dyson Daniels, those sort of types. If you're looking for more of that scoring assist threes, I think Keontae George is one of the better later round targets to get. And and similar, I'd be happy to go into round 10 to get him. So before I'm going onto my bench, not as high as a men, I don't think, but probably around that pick 100 is about the sweet spot to get Keontae George, in my opinion, um, if you really want him on your team. Anywhere between 100 and 120, I think is a great spot to get him, um, knowing that there is a bit of downside. But at this point, uh, a starting point guard does obviously offer a lot of value. So he is the final one to make this list. And that is 10 names between pick 51 and 120 for you guys to target in your fantasy drafts. We're going to round out the final... um, preseason rankings, sleepers, must draft players tomorrow with the the later round flyers guys, the players going outside the 120 that I think are really, really good targets to potentially win your league or at least go a long way to doing so. Um, And then I may or may not give you guys a final um, recording of a real auction draft that I'm doing this weekend. Um, Haven't yet decided if I'm going to be able to record that or not. It's very early in the morning at um, when I'm going to be drafting. So we'll see. Um, but drop your comments down in the comment section below, guys. If you're over on YouTube, give us a five-star rating and review if you're listening to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Make sure you subscribe wherever you are listening to the podcast and tell your friends about it. If you've got a draft coming up, let everyone know so you can have a really super fun competitive league and talk shit about how my takes are all crap and the same as everyone else's. I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.